here. So you all should see five knives on my board. If you were wondering what this white thing is in front of me, it's actually the camera that you're now seeing the board with. So these are the five essential knives. And I'm gonna go through them uh, one by one. They are, they are ranked sort of, the first two are definitely in order of importance. The rest one you could argue based on preference, but I think these are the, the, the order that they go. Um, so the first one, of course, is the chef's knife. This is the real workhorse of the kitchen. Um, the chef knife is probably the knife you're gonna reach for the most. Uh, it's also the first knife you should buy if you go out and buy a nice knife. Um, so, uh, and we're gonna spend most of the time today talking just about the chef's knife. The second one there is a paring knife. It's, I like to call it the mini chef's knife. Um, it can do a lot of the things the uh, chef knife can do, but only in miniature. So if you wanted to chop up strawberries or core a tomato or pare an apple or wanted to um, dice up small pieces of ginger, your paring knife here would be your, your best option. And then after that, you know, it really those two could probably get you through 90 to 95 percent of your cutting duties in the kitchen. Um, that's how uh, powerful most of that is the chef knife, of course, but you do need that smaller knife. You don't want to be, you know, trying to pair an apple with something like this uh, or trying to core one or, or a tomato. Um, and then uh, the, the third knife is the bread knife. Um, neither of the first two knives are really good. In fact, the, the next three knives all sort of have um, a particular focus, um, but the bread knife is the one that can get through a crusty loaf of bread because of this serrated edge. It works like a saw and rips right through a crusty loaf of bread as well as a soft crumb of a bread without tearing it up. And sometimes you can cut a piece of bread with a, a chef's knife, but a lot of times if you try to do like a big boule or something, it, you might end up smashing the loaf. So that's why you want the bread knife. And then number coming at number four on the hip parade is the flexible boning knife. This is the one you would use to get meat off of a chicken or to get meat off of a, you know, a bone out of a roast or something like that, or a steak or something. And the reason it's good for that is it's flexible. As you can see here, it bends a lot more than the other ones. You, your chef knife will never really, or shouldn't bend that much. And it's also smaller, which makes it agile and getting it around a bone and stuff like that. So that's the bone knife. And then the last one would be the slicer. Um, and this is something that would be very handy coming up in Thanksgiving. It's great for cutting a roasted turkey, um, a pot roast, uh, or not, not a pot roast, but a oven roast. Um, so, it, you know, it in general is, um, is narrower than and, uh, other knives. So there's less surface area. And it's also usually the longest knife. You have plenty of, of knife blade there to get through a thick piece of meat. Or, uh, you know, if you're cutting a steak at an angle or something like that. Not to say that you couldn't cut meat with a chef's knife, but this one is actually a little bit more suited for that. So those are the five uh, most essential knives. Anything after that is sort of like, um, I would call it icing on the cake. You might get yourself, uh, I don't know, you might go out and get yourself a Sudoku, um, which is sort of like a chef's knife. It's sort of a hybrid of a, a vegetable chopper. But, um, you know, it, it, it serves a, a pretty good purpose, but it doesn't do everything. So it's like, again, I don't think you have to have it, but it's one of those knives. There's plenty of them out there that um, you might like over, you know, uh, as for a specialty or something like that, a vegetable cleaver, a meat cleaver. If you were into butchering meat, you would go get a cleaver. But for most cooks, this is, this is the essential five. And I'm wondering, I'm sure, I'm sure Fred has... Do you have every one of these, Fred? I bet you have every one of these. He's, uh, you're a little muted there. I do, but I primarily use my Santoku knife most of the time because uh, I'm sort of a, I'm not a total vegan, but I don't, uh, I, I chop lots of vegetables and I yeah. usually only are cutting chicken and things like that. I don't cut through bones. And, so right. I use Later. my Santoku for, just about everything. Right, exactly. Well, for the rest of what we're going to do here, we're going to focus on the, uh, the chef's knife here. And I'm going to bring up here a little bit of anatomy. You don't have, don't worry about that. There's no test. You don't have to memorize anything. You probably don't need to know most of what's on here. Um, and you probably could figure out which is the tip, which is the edge, and where the handle is. Um, uh, but if, if you were to mistake this for the handle, then we really do need to have another 
another class of, uh, um, on this, but really, honestly, um, the only two things I want to bring your attention to is two pieces here. One is the bolster. Uh, the bolster is a product of forging a knife, and it's that area there behind the blade, but in front of the handle. And there's a lot of controversy over whether or not you need a bolster. People will argue that a bolster gives you balance and gives you um, heft, and it does, it's true, but that's not necessarily required. Um, so let me just bring it up here. You, here you see this has a bolster too, but unlike the knife in the picture, the knife in the picture has a bolster that goes all the way down to the heel. This bolster uh, stops right here. And the advantage there is if you were sharpening your knife uh, without a bolster in the back, you, um, you have, you, it's much easier to get that back corner, that heel there. So, you know, you might want to consider that when you're looking at knives and saying, you know, do I want the bolster? Am I going to sharpen my own knives? That sort of thing. We'll talk more about, about bolsters. The other thing I wanted to point out to you is the tang. Now in the picture, it's hard to see the tang because it's in the handle, but this is the tang. And this tang is called a full tang. It runs from bolster to the end of the knife. And the handle is actually uh, scales that have been riveted to the knife. And there's again, a lot of controversy. People think you have to have a tang like this. There is also something called a partial tang, um, which, uh, or sometimes it's called a stick tang. This knife here is also a chef knife without a bolster and without a full tang. Uh, the tang is, is, is a partial tang or a stick tang and it's been glued in here. And on this one here, it's been riveted to the handle. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit more about why, which one, you know, why there's a controversy and, and stuff like that, which one you would want. But just for now, when I, you hear me talk about the tang, no, it is this thing. And, and in case of this knife, it goes all the way around. Um, and then in this case, it's a partial tang. Okay. All right. All right. Let's talk quickly about knives, how they're made. I, I, it's a, I've really sort of shortened it here, but basically every knife starts as a strip of metal called a, a blank. Um, the thickness of that blank is whether it's going to be forged or stamped, the two different types of uh, processing, the two major types of processing a knife, a forged knife is like it sounds. It's like in the olden days, someone took an anvil and a, and a hammer and put the metal there and, and, and forged the knife from hot steel. Um, nowadays, it's done with a machine, that, a series of machines that can apply up to 400 tons of pressure. Um, so it's a little bit different today. Um, and in a stamped, uh, it's just like it says, a die stamps the metal, 